About the museum. The idea to create the Museum of the History of Polish Jews originated at the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute of Poland and gradually garnered widespread approval both in Poland and abroad. In 1995, thanks to the support of individual and institutional donors, work on the project of the museum began and continued as a social initiative until 2005. On the 25th of January 2005, Long-term efforts of the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute of Poland finally bore fruit. On that day, on the initiative of then Mayor of Warsaw Lech Kaczynski, the museum was formally established as a public-private partnership of the Association, the City of Warsaw, and the Ministry of Culture and National Heritage. The agreement, which brought to life the jointly financed cultural institution, was signed by Mayor Lech Kaczynski, Waldemar Dombrowski, then Minister of Culture, and Professor Jerzy Tomaszewski, Deputy Chairman of the Association. With time, thanks to the funds raised mainly from private individuals and foundations from the United States, Germany, the United Kingdom and Poland, work on the project of a future museum became possible. Unique documentation of Polish Judaica both in the country and abroad was collected in a wide international support network requisite to raise funds needed to design and produce the core exhibition was established. Mission to preserve and recall the memory of the history of Polish Jews and to counteract anti-Semitism, discrimination, and exclusion by fostering mutual understanding and respect. Vision. Situated at a site of great historical significance, we feel a moral responsibility to present the complex history of Polish Jews as relevant today and as a source of profound, transformative experience. We want the museum to be critical, accessible, and collaborative. Mission Statement. The Poland Museum of the History of Polish Jews stands in what was once the heart of Jewish Warsaw, an area which the Germans turned into a ghetto during World War II. Its modern building faces the monument to the ghetto heroes, thus creating a unique space for remembrance and reflection. The monument pays tribute to the struggle and suffering of Polish Jews, while the Poland Museum recalls their history, showing also that the Holocaust, contrary to the criminal intentions of its organizers, did not mark the end of Jewish life and culture in Poland. At the heart of the Poland Museum is the core exhibition, The Journey Through the 1,000-Year History of Polish Jews, narrated from different perspectives in many voices. Through this journey we hope to offer our visitors a transformative experience, so that the history of Polish Jews becomes as meaningful and vivid to them as their own. Our goal is to raise historical awareness and highlight the relevance of the past for understanding the present and shaping the future. We believe that exposure to the rich and dramatic history of Polish Jews helps develop empathy and respect for people of different religions and cultures. We want as vast a swath of the public as possible to discover a deeper, unadulterated picture of Polish-Jewish relations. These goals are especially important today as we witness a surge of anti-Semitism, reaching levels not seen in Poland since March 68. We are confronted with the rise of xenophobia, ethno-nationalism, brutalization of public debate, and the normalization of hate speech, especially on social media. Anti-Semitic and racist organizations remain marginal, but their influence is growing, above all amongst the youth. The Eleventh Commandment is, Thou shalt not be indifferent, a commandment passed down by the historian and Auschwitz survivor Marian Tursky, guides our outlook and shapes our actions. It is in this spirit that we will defend historical truth. We will remain a platform for open debate, a center for bold and ambitious temporary exhibitions, educational programs, and social campaigns, engaging broad audiences in person and online, a model cultural institution that lowers barriers for marginalized groups, especially people with disabilities, a home to precious and accessible collections of tangible and intangible heritage, a museum which supports local initiatives to preserve and promote the knowledge and appreciation of Jewish history and culture across Poland. Fully aware of the dramatic history of Polish Jews, we feel a moral obligation to promote responsible citizenship and foster open communities that respect all members, cherish diversity, and welcome minorities. Historical information the Jews on their way to Umschlagplatz guarded by Germans. Historical information the Jews on their way to Umschlagplatz guarded by Germans. On the 19th of April 1943, the Jews of Warsaw took up armed struggle against the Germans. The insurgents had no hope for victory. They were driven by a desire to seek revenge and to incur the greatest possible losses on their perpetrators. First and foremost, however, they chose to die with dignity, with guns in their hands. 
Facing an impending annihilation, they did not want to die without a fight. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was the largest and most heroic act of armed resistance taken up by the Jews during World War II. It was also the first civic uprising in occupied Europe. Germans squeezed over 400,000 Jews within the walled in area of the Warsaw Ghetto they had established in 1940. In the ghetto, tens of thousands of people died of starvation and disease. On the 22nd of July 1942, the so-called Great Deportation Action began. Within the period of two months, the Germans deported nearly 300,000 ghetto residents to their deaths in the Treblinka extermination camp. In the autumn of 1942, near 60,000 Jews remained in the so-called Risk Ghetto, Jir. The remnants of a ghetto, also referred to as Residual Ghetto. They were mostly young and strong, with no family ties, often employed at the German shops, i.e. small factories and workshops. It was in these circumstances, with nothing left to lose, that the idea of armed resistance against the Nazis was born amongst the Jewish youth in the Warsaw Ghetto. The Jewish Combat Organization The Jewish Combat Organization, Zydowska Organization Bojo, Zob in short, was established as early as the 28th of July 1942, in the course of the Great Liquidation Action. Its members included activists of the left-oriented Zionist youth movements. Later communists and socialists joined in, too. Mordecai Anjelovich of the Hashomer Hatzair organization became the leader, and amongst the most famous commanders were Merrick Edelman, member of the Bund, and Yitzhak Kukir, member of Droll. Another underground organization brought to life in the early 1943 was the Jewish military union, Zydowski Zwiezek Waskow, ZZW in short, led by Leon Rodow and Pavel Franklin. Another deportation action, launched by the Germans on the 18th of January 1943, was met with an armed resistance of the Zob militants. To the Jews, the occupying force has instigated the second act of your genocide. Do not give in, defend yourselves, reads the Zob leaflet issued at the time. The four-day-long self-defense delayed the final liquidation of the ghetto and provided some time for the preparations for armed uprising. After January 1943, a frantic construction of bunkers and other forms of shelters began. The authority of the Jewish combat organization rose, too. The outbreak of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising When the 2,000 soldier-strong German units, supported by tanks and armored vehicles, entered the ghetto on the 19th of April 1943, the eve of the Passover holiday, they were faced by 300 to 500 Zog members divided into 22 militant groups led by Anjelovich, along with 250 militants of the Jewish military union. There were also other armed groups, unaffiliated with the two main underground organizations. On the German side, over 1,000 Waffen-SS soldiers and policemen took part in the armed combat each day. The first street skirmishes instigated by the Zob fighters took place at the intersections of Gessia and Milevsky streets, and Mila and Zamenhofa streets, with insurgents on the upper floors of buildings throwing grenades and bottles with petrol at the German units. In the afternoon of the 19th of April, skirmishes at the Muranowski Square began. ZZW, led by Pavel Frankl, fiercely resisted German attacks. The struggle continued for the following three days. Jewish and Polish flags, hung on a tall tenement house at Muranowski Square, became a symbol of the uprising. On the 20th of April, the Zog militants led by Merrick Edelman engaged in a heavy combat on the location of the so-called brushmaker's shop. They managed to stop the Germans for some time by detonating a special mine near the gate to the workshop area. On the first day of the uprising, a home army unit made an unsuccessful attempt at blowing up the ghetto wall along Bonifraterska Street. In the course of the uprising, several more attempts at combating the Germans who continued to shell the insurgents' positions were carried out along the ghetto wall by the Home Army and People's Guard units. Regular armed struggle continued in the ghetto only in the first few days of the uprising. The shortage of munition combined with the fires deliberately started by the Germans which drove the insurgents to the bunkers and basements made it impossible to continue armed resistance. The fighters hid in shelters together with the civilians, organizing frequent raids and ambushes on the Germans who continued to penetrate the ghetto area. Clashes were becoming increasingly irregular. From the end of April, the insurgents spent days hidden in the bunkers. They would go out at night, and that is when fire exchanges with German patrols took place. Fights with the Germans also took place in defense of the discovered bunkers. 
One of the largest such battles was fought on the 1st to the 3rd of May by fighters from Merrick Edelman's unit. Several hundred armed insurgents were only a fraction of the Warsaw Ghetto population which amounted to 45 minus 50,000 in April 1943. It was precisely due to the attitude of the civilian population, who refused to obey the German orders for eviction and remained hidden in bunkers and other hiding places, that the German liquidation action lasted as long as four weeks. The Germans' goal was to deport the Jews employed at the shops to the forced labor camps in the Loveland region and to send the wild, naive unemployed Jews to their death in Treblinka. The Nazis were taken aback by the widespread passive resistance of the ghetto population. They were forced to systematically search one block after another, setting fire to each building they had searched and plundered in order to make the Jews hiding inside come out. They threw smoked candles, grenades or explosive materials to every bunker they had discovered, regardless of the fact that, aside from the insurgents, there were civilians hiding in them. The civilians who came out of the bunkers were led to Umschlach plots and from there sent to the death camps, from the 12th of May onwards only to Treblinka. The insurgents, and many civilians, too, were killed on the spot. Hiding in underground bunkers was an extreme experience, overcrowding, lack of air, fresh water and food, high temperatures and smoke from the fires raging on the surface, constant tension and, finally, the necessity to remain still in order not to be heard by the German patrols cruising above. People stuck in the bunkers often had no contact with the outside world for many days. The fate of people hiding in the shelters on the upper floors of tenement houses that were set on fire was even worse. Many of those chose a suicidal jump from the window. Stroop's report contains photographs documenting people falling several floors down to meet their death on the pavement. Thousands of people perished in the fire, under the ruins of the demolished buildings, or in the bunkers, blown up or buried under the rubble. Jürgen Stroop, who led the German units during the uprising, wrote in his report on the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto that his soldiers had captured or killed over 56,000 Jews and located 631 bunkers. According to the Stroop's report, 36,000 people were deported to labor camps in the Lublin province. The rest were killed on the spot or in the gas chambers of Treblinka. The data provided in the report are most likely exaggerated, yet there is no other data to refer to. Simultaneously, the Germans continued a painstaking search for Jews in hiding on the Aryan side, offering financial rewards for assistance in capturing them. The end of the uprising and the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto. Mere several dozen of the insurgents managed to flee the burning ghetto through the sewers or underground tunnels. Many of the survivors were later killed as a result of denunciations, some fought in the Warsaw Uprising. On the 8th of May 1943, the Germans surrounded the bunker of the Zob headquarters at 18 Mila Street. Over a hundred of militants, including Mordecai Anjelovich, suffocated to death or swallowed poison in order to avoid being captured by the Germans. However, several small groups of insurgents continued to resist. On the 16th of May, in light of the decreasing numbers of captured Jews, Stroop decided on finalizing his action. In the evening of that day, to mark their victory, the Germans blew up the Great Synagogue on Tilomaki Street, the area beyond the residual ghetto borders. Stroop jotted down in his report, The Jewish district in Warsaw is no more. In the aftermath of the uprising, the Germans razed the area of the former Warsaw ghetto to the ground. And yet there were people, both civilians and few surviving fighters, still hiding inside the ghetto, in the burnt-down houses and in the bunkers undiscovered by the Germans. Both German police dispatches and Polish underground press reported that gunshots could be heard in the area of the ghetto as late as June. Some, rubblers, hid in the ruins of the ghetto until the end of 1943. The Multiply awarded building of Poland Museum is a gem of contemporary architecture. Its symbolism touches upon Jewish history while the building itself reflects the idea of a museum of life that Poland Museum promotes. The Poland Museum building is stark and aloof, its facades clad with copper and glass. Inside, an undulating and dynamic ravine splits the building in two separate halves. The museum building boasts 12, 8 square meters usable floor space. One third of it is occupied by the core exhibition, while the remaining space accommodates offices and various other purposes, temporary exhibitions. Multi-purpose auditorium and concert hall, capacity, 450 people, screening rooms, education center rooms, resource center, 
King Matt's Family Education Area, Culture Cafe, Restaurant and Museum Store. The museum building was constructed at a symbolic spot, the very heart of a once thriving district inhabited mainly by Jews and during the war transformed by the Germans into a ghetto. The Monument to the Ghetto Heroes, designed by Nathan Rappaport, was erected here in 1948. The Poland in Museum Building rose on the plot located amongst the residential buildings of Murano, reconstructed after the end of the war. Producing an architectural design for this very location, envisioning a building aimed to tell a 1,000-year history, was by no means an easy task. The project designed by a Finnish architectural office Lodelma and Malamaki won an international architectural competition organized in 2005 and headed by Bodin Pachowski. Over 100 architects from all over the world submitted their projects to the competition, amongst them Svi Hegel, Kengo Kuma and Dan Kalibskin. The jury appreciated Rainer Malamaki's project for its restraint and moderation with which it referred to the recent Polish Jewish history. Despite its plain, geometrical volume, the building boasts a unique interior. Dynamic, curved walls of the main hall divide the building along the east-west axis. This fissure symbolizes a gap in the 1,000-year-long history of Polish Jews. Simultaneously, the monumental hall, full of light let in by an unusually large blazing opening onto the park, reminds us that the history has not yet ended, and that Poland Museum is indeed the Museum of Life. It also serves as a link between the past, the present and the future, symbolized by a bridge on the first floor level, connecting the two halves of the building. The symbolism of the museum is not limited to the interior, the building's facade is clad with glass panels printed with Hebrew and Latin letters which read, Poland, heaven. Rest here, thus evoking the legend of Jewish arrival in the Polish land. The museum's name stems from this very legend. The Finnish architect made sure his projects fitted in well with the surroundings. The building was constructed on a square plan, akin to the square of the monument to the ghetto heroes. Its volume corresponds with the shape of adjacent residential buildings and the monument itself. The monument and the building enter into a dialogue, the former being a place of reflection and commemoration of those who perished, the latter providing means to discover the history of a Jewish existence in Poland. In June 2009, two years after the winning project had been selected, an official ceremony of setting the foundation stone at the future building's location took place. The construction of Poland Museum of the History of Polish Jews began. It was completed in 2012. History, from the idea, through the Ohel, to the Poland Museum. A chronology of the Poland Museum of the History of Polish Jews, 1993-2014. 1993. Rajina Pollan, Organization and Information Director of the Jewish Historical Institute, C, attended the opening of the Holocaust Museum in Washington. Upon her return to Poland, she suggested that the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute establish a museum about life, which would present the history of Jews in Poland. Chaim Herzog, former president of Israel and Ronald S. Lauder, president of the Lauder Foundation, became co-chairman of the Honorary International Committee. Shortly after, leaders of Jewish organizations from around the world joined the committee, among them being Jan Novak Jezieranski, Jan Karski, Zbigniew Brzezinski, the project was also supported by Hillary Clinton, Stuart E. Eisenstadt, Shevach Weiss, and Gerson Zohar. The aim of the committee was to promote the concept of the museum project, to garner support from international organizations and to coordinate their activities at an international forum. 1994. The Association of the Jewish Historical Institute begins working with Geshayat Weinberg, former director and creator of the Diaspora Museum in Tel Aviv and the Holocaust Museum in Washington. Together with him, representatives of the association prepare general principles and a budget for the project. The inauguration of the museum project and its first international presentation take place during a reception at the Polish Consulate General in New York in the presence of 150 guests. 1996. The Association of the Jewish Historical Institute Board formally appoints a Museum of the History of Polish Jews Project Team, chaired by Yeshayahu Weinberg. The project director is Jerzy Halberstadt. The team's task is to develop the museum's program, to work with individuals and organizations, in Poland and abroad, who can help bring the project to fruition and to manage the work being conducted. Ronald Lauder's foundation provides the first funds for the work of the museum project team. 1997. 
Under a notarized deed, the city of Warsaw gives the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute perpetual use of 13,000 square meters of land upon which to construct the museum. The land lies in the heart of the pre-war Jewish district, opposite the monument to the ghetto heroes. 1998. Archaeological work commences at the site designated for the construction of the museum. 1999. British firm Event Communications is selected as the designer of the museum's core exhibition. In the following year, work begins on the exhibition program. 2000 to 2003. Work commences on the core exhibition. Master plan. The most important topics are selected. Key exhibition elements are identified. The exhibition is divided into galleries corresponding to epics. 2002. Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet is appointed as a permanent consultant to the exhibition. She is Professor of Performing Arts at the Tisch School of Arts, New York University. She is a cultural anthropologist and a researcher into contemporary museum theory. 2003. The Polish government announces its financial commitment to the construction of the museum. 2005. Lech Kaczynski, Mayor of Warsaw, Waldemar Dombrowski, Polish Minister of Culture and National Heritage, and Professor Jerzy Tomaszewski, Vice Chairman of the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute in Poland, sign an agreement establishing a common cultural institution called the Museum of the History of Polish Jews. Jerzy Halberstadt becomes the museum's first director. The Association of the Jewish Historical Institute announces an international architectural competition to design the museum building. From 119 entries, the jury select 11 candidates who are invited to take part in workshops and to prepare competitive designs. The winner is Rainer Malamaki, Architects Ladelma and Malamaki, Finland. 2006. The Association of the Jewish Historical Institute, together with the museum, begins historical program devoted to the personal stories of Polish Jews, the collection of family memories, Polish roots in Israel and recording the Jewish world in Poland. The Ohel Ed, Tent begins activity on the site of the future museum. It conducts artistic, cultural and informative activities intended to promote the museum. 2007. The museum's foundation stone is laid. Those taking part in the official ceremony included representatives of the highest levels of government in Poland and abroad. Among them are Lech Kaczynski, Polish President, Aleksander Kwasniewski, Polish President, 1995 to 2005. Richard von Weizsäcker, German President, 1984 to 1994. And Tevi D. Troy, representing the U.S. President. The Catholic Church is represented by, among others, Cardinal Casimir's Nitsch, Archbishop of Warsaw. Museum donors and friends include Danuta Hubner, at the time, European Commissioner for Regional Politics, Shevach Weiss, former Knesset Speaker and Israeli Ambassador to Poland. Mayor Lau, former Chief Rabbi of Israel, and Michael Shudra, Chief Rabbi of Poland. 2007 to 2012. The Association of the Jewish Historical Institute begins raising funds from individual and institutional donors in Poland and abroad, capital campaign, in order to create the core exhibition. This fundraising effort provides important support for the museum's ongoing activities. 2009. The construction of the museum commences. 2011. Work is completed on the detailed documentation of the concept which precisely defines the structure and substantive content of the core exhibition. At the point, work with event communications ends. Reconstruction of the first item of the core exhibition begins, the timber ceiling and vaults of the 17th century synagogue of Gwozdik. Students from Poland, Israel and the United States take part in an educational workshop project entitled Gwozdik Reconstruction. Under the watchful eyes of a group of international historians, architects and artists, together, they create one of the main items of the Miasteczko, the Jewish town, gallery. The Polish firm Nizio Design International is chosen to finish the project and to create the core exhibition based on event communications concept. 2013. The 19th of April. The official opening of the museum building takes place with the participation of Polish state authorities and guests from around the world. Cultural and educational projects begin, temporary exhibitions, theatrical performances, musical performances, film screenings, educational activities for children and families and academic lectures. 2014. The 28th of October, the grand opening of the Poland Museum's core exhibition takes place. Poland Museum Collection. 
One of the most important tasks of the Poland Museum is to collect objects that represent the heritage of Polish Jews. The museum collection includes items related to religious practices, Judaica, works of art, as well as historical collections and archaeological artifacts. A digital collection are objects created from scratch with the use of digital techniques are a separate part of the collection. Those are, e.g., oral history recordings and contemporary photographic documentation of Jewish monuments. Polin Museum Collection in Numbers Exhibits and Archives, including deposits, 17,500 items. Digital Collection Over 1,000 oral history recordings, 70,000 photographs documenting material heritage, 362,000 archival iconography. Library Collection 15,000 items. Judaica in the collection of the Poland Museum are mainly objects used during religious practices. Those are, e.g., candlesticks, decorative herb containers, containers for storing fragrant herbs, or kiddush cups used during summer. The museum's collection also includes items directly related to prayer, such as ataras decorated with silver embroidery or velvet bags to keep a tallit, prayer shawl, after prayer. The works of art collection of the Poland Museum includes works from the 19th and 20th centuries, as well as contemporary ones. The works are related to the heritage of Polish Jews through the biography of the authors, works by Roman Kramstein, Marek Schwartz, Franciska Themerson, Eva Kurlup, Elżbieta Nadel, etc., or through the undertaken subject, in the case of works by contemporary artists, Wilhelm Sassner, Jadwiga Sawicka or Hubert Cherepov. The historical and archive collection is the largest group of items in the collection of the museum. Among them, there are historical objects and personal memorabilia or archives. This collection documents the history of Polish Jews, from the second half of the 19th century to the present day. It is the history presented from the perspective of the community, as well as of families or individuals. The collection includes items for everyday use, such as cutlery, crockery or clothes, as well as photographs, personal documents, manuscripts and letters. Collections of a personal nature are often supplemented by oral history recordings and digital documentation. The digital collection consists of photographic documentation of material Jewish heritage, oral history recordings, and digitized iconographic archives. The collection also includes biographical and problem studies created for our knowledge portals virtual shtetl and the Polish Righteous. We collect and publish documentation of Jewish objects of material culture from Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania and Latvia, historical regions of Polish and Flantine Voivodeship in Poland. The collection includes photographs of synagogues and former Hasidic centers as in unique wooden synagogues in Pokroje, Rezica and Lusin. We have photographic documentation of monuments, memorial sites and Holocaust centers taken with a drone. Those include images of monuments in Krakow and Lublin and the synagogue complex in Willadawa. In the collected reports in the form of audio and video recordings, we document the fate of Polish Jews from the perspective of everyday life and personal experience of the interviewees. Mainly Jewish emigrants from Poland, their descendants, representatives of the contemporary Jewish community in Poland. Among the collected reports, we have an extensive and unique collection of interviews with the participants and witnesses of the events of March, 68, compared to other cultural institutions, 160 recordings obtained between 2016 and 2020, a collection of interviews with Polish righteous among the nations, over 400 testimonies recorded between 2007 and 2020, and a collection of interviews with the donors of the museum, over 140 interviews done systematically since 2013. Additionally, the digital collection of the museum includes a set of photographs and family memoirs, Polish roots in Israel, more than 1,300 interviews and more than 24,000 photographs from the period from 1880 to 1960.